This is SciBite episode 80 for February 5th, 2013. And welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science show, live Tuesday nights and fresh every Wednesday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. What are we talking about today? Today, we're going to take a look at measuring arthritis, Stephen Hawking's voice, building moons with a game, an update on the subglacial lakes, viewer feedback, spacecraft updates, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Whoa, that sounds like a big show. Why don't we kick it yes. off with the news? All right, Heather, where do we start tonight? Arthritis. Oh, it's creaky. It's mm. terrible. Mm-hmm. But what if your doctor could actually listen to your body to monitor the way the way your joys sound when they bend and flex mm. in order to have some early detection or moder- moder- monitor the severity of your arthritis, like osteoarthritis. Right. Which is, you know, caused by wear and tear in the joints of the cartilage, which, you know, slowly ekes away and then you just have bone on bone and it's not happy and it's very uncomfortable. So what it is suggesting that being able to detect that friction in and of itself means that Maybe we're going into directions that can get to the root cause of it. Hmm. So, like I said, it's the osteoarthritis, the pretty much the most common kind of arthritis there is. It means the pads of cartilage wear away as bone grinding up against bone. But what they're finding is that it's not just any kind of friction that leads to that kind of wear and tear on the cartil- on the on the material. Now it's believed that a high friction force or a coefficient of friction that's the primary factor in surface wear and tear damage. New, actually, new free research has found that that's not actually the case. Is that it's more like stick slip friction. So regular friction is like the difference between where you're sliding on ice. So that's very low friction. Or you're standing on something very rough. You know, you have a piece of something on some sandpaper. And it doesn't want to roll down because there's a high amount of friction there. Did I lose you? Oh, sorry. And so the this stick slip, what they're talking about is when... It actually comes from, you can have it in computer hard drives and crashes. It's when you sort of, it sticks just a little bit and then it jumps. So it's not a smooth Ouch. friction. That just hurts just thinking about it. Yeah. So it's a little, sticks a little bit and then jerks, almost like a violin string. It's not actually one smooth motion. It's a whole bunch of start and stops, which is what makes that, all those little jerks make that sound that you hear when you Strump when you know someone who knows what they're doing jumps the bow. So all of those, and it's not necessarily something you can feel significantly. It's just very, very tiny ones. But no matter how small, they actually, you know, are essentially impacting the cartilage. So over time, a whole bunch of those impacts can deform the surface of it. Now, so you have a little penny hammer. Mm-hmm knock against a a rock or a piece of sheet metal or something, it's not going to do much. But if you're sitting there doing it and you have the patience of a two-year-old who's trying to annoy you (laughs) and you do it 10,000 times, you're going to start to see some surface abrasion. So they're having trouble on the mic. Since it's on such a microscopic level, it's not easy to tell the difference between those two types of friction, a smooth sliding joint, might feel the same even if it's undergoing some of this uh, stick slip or stiction, this sort of jumping, sort of stopping and starting. 
And so in the early stages of arthritis, that's kind of important to be able to see if you could tell which one it is, then you could sort of forecast what's going on and sort of get a head start on everything. So what they have is they have this instrument called the Surface Forces Apparatus. It actually measures the frictional forces um, mm. of the between like the pad of tissue that covers the ends of your bones. So it, it measures that. So by studying the patterns of it, exiting it almost like an like an EEG or an EKG, should I say? And so it spits out these acoustic electric sensors. So you can look at it and say, this, you can see it's smooth, or you'll see a jagged sawtooth pattern where it's, you know, sticking together and letting loose a whole bunch of different times. So what you're able to see is you can kind of see how much kind of measure and diagnose how much damage to the cartilage is actually there. So maybe you have a medication or a exercise regime or something, and you can tell, you know, you can wa- monitor how well that's actually helping your, your joints. That makes sense. So kind of taking this back, they, I mean, they are working towards studying, uh, synovial fluid that's the lubricant in the cartilage and all that kind of stuff so they know that fluid also plays a major role on whether or not there's this wear and tear so they're kind of coming out of all this at different ways they're looking at the lubrication this synovial fluid they're looking at maybe you know practical fundamental ways to look is there is looking at this these patterns and seeing how it degrades, can they work it work it backwards and maybe find some sort of a way to prevent that sort of stick slip motion? So can you smooth those jars out? And if you could measure specifically right away that it's smoothing itself out, then you've definitely onto something that's going to be helping preserve what cartilage is there. Right, and I like the idea that since it's pretty non-invasive, it's just listening. Oh, yes. it's, you know, you really could almost measure it on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, I have family members who have, you know, severe arthritis and stuff. I know somebody who's had a complete knee replacement. And so being able to measure that over time instead of having to maybe go into an MRI, try to read the details of the MRI going, okay, well, we'll see how this is doing. But like you said, being able to start a an exercise regime or on a medication and be able to go in on a weekly basis and going, nope, something really bad happened this week. What did you do? What did you do? Or, hey, everything's going much better. So this is one of those things that a lot of people are going to have to deal with. I'm pretty sure I will have to. Mm. Very much I've given up. I have resigned myself to the fact. Oh, oh. Hey, Hey, if you if you face it that way, who cares? And then I guess best case so, scenario is nothing happens. Yeah. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'll just have a little pair, a stethoscope, hook it up to something really strong, <laughs> listen to my knees, be like, all right, knees, you creak, but are you creaking in the right way? Are you creaking in a very wrong way? Right. Are you getting more creaky? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, uh, very good. So uh, interesting thoughts. And if you uh, have family members, maybe you have arthritis issues. You can send them that link. You can find the yeah. link in our show notes. Just go find SciBite 80 over on our website, and uh, you'll scroll down from the video and find the show notes there. Any other thoughts on that one, Heather? No, just looking forward to where that goes. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, I just want to take a quick second and pause. And uh, I've noticed recently a big uptick in mono price. I don't know. Have you ever bought anything from mono price, Heather? No, I'm not even sure what it is. Okay, well, you, well so mono price is good for like, uh, you like say you need like an HDMI cable. If you go to Best Buy and you get like a six foot HDMI cable, it's like thirty bucks, right? Yeah. Well, so you could get like a thirty foot HDMI cable from Mono Price for like seven dollars, right? They just have like crazy prices, and they're wow. they're decent quality stuff, and so that's where I get like a or or they also have a lot of high end audio and video cabling too. So that's where like a lot of the studio uh, cabling's all come from has been Mono Price. Uh, But the way their link system works is we don't have them linked down here at the bottom of our site. Now, before you shop, we have an affiliate system that you can use that supports the network. uh, And it doesn't really impact your existing budget since you're just doing it with stuff you are already going to purchase. We have links at the bottom of our website for Amazon and eBay and Netflix and Newegg and ThinkGeek and Best Buy and Audible, which is amazing. 
But model price isn't down there because the way their system works, we can't link it like that. But if you're using Chrome and Fire or Firefox, we have links down there for our browser extensions. And if you install those, uh, then you will automatically tag your shopping session when you browse many of our sites, ones that we don't even have listed down there. We have it for both Chrome and Firefox, and Monoprice is one of them. So if you've been thinking you want to buy stuff from Monoprice, uh, go grab those extensions, and then you'll automatically be supporting the network when you make your purchases. And uh, thank you to everybody who does that, and, and we uh, keep on plugging away thanks to you guys. So thank and you very much. And almighty extensions, you help those of us you can't remember. I know, right? <laughs> that's, that's the great thing about them. All right, Heather, well then let's move on to the news bite. All right, what do we have in the news bite? Stephen Hawking's voice. You hear that? You can picture in your mind the theater of the mind, the sounds of your mind. His voice, his computer generated voice. Yeah. Now he's for a long time he's result he's relied on that technology in order to communicate with the outside world. And he's had this um, he's had his disease for the past fifty years now, and a computer scientist. At this last year's, in at this year's, should I say, International Consumer Electronics Show, CES, actually said that he and his team were close to a breakthrough that could actually boost the rate of his words per minute. He's actually down to one word a minute. He could only speak one word a minute. Oh, I didn't realize it was like that bad. Yeah. What it is now is that essentially he's got just a few things that he can move. He's got a cheek he can twitch, and that's what it's been based off is just that. Essentially, there's a little little square that highlights a letter going through all the letters of the alphabet. And you, you know, you twitch when it gets to the letter you want. Mm. And then it starts over and you go to the next letter. Tedious. Oh, my gosh. So, very tedious. So there, But actually, he has the ability to move um, more things. Okay. He can actually uh, move his mouth and an eyebrow, I think. Okay. So what they can, what they're hoping to do is to be able to use all of these different things and some software to maybe pick it back up to five words a minute, maybe huh. even 10. Okay. It's, yeah, I mean, you know, if you think if you really have to communicate, you yeah. can get basic things, you know, even if it's food or water. Yeah. But I mean, essentially one word a minute to five words a minute is speeding up the amount of time you can talk by t- a factor of five. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's, it's definitely quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, right now he's got you know, the little black box under his wheelchair, and that has the audio amplifier, the voltage, the USB soft hardware key, and all that in order to look at the infrared sensor on his eyeglasses. And that detects a change in light as he twitches his cheek. That's what's going on there. Wow. And so then the voice synthesizer in the back is, you know, the black box on the back of his chair and gets all the information from USB serial port. So actually Intel has been supplying him with the technology since the 1990s. And for the past, you know, like I was saying, he's been vol- working on that voluntary twitch in his cheek. But each, in uh, late uh, 2011, he actually reached out to Intel co-founder and said, hey, um, my ability to speak, you know, essentially saying one word a minute, isn't really catching it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's slowing down even more. Can you guys help me at all? So, you know, he met with him and said, well, actually, you know, yes, we can. I think so. You have, you know, the cheek twitch. You can move the mouth and some eyebrow movement. And we've got better and, sensors now than when yeah, they built well, that. Yeah, better sensors. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, with more than one ability thing to move, you can do, you know, Morse code type stuff. Multiple movements at once can very much speed up, you know, indicating what letter you want, what word you want. They'll make um, sort of advanced, better word processing predictors. So Mm. kind of predicting what word he wants. So, you know, going through, you know, twitch your cheek trying to get there. You know, and then once you, it actually picks up the word you want. If you raise your eyebrow, hooray, that's the word I want. Yes. Now I'm moving on to the next word. So they're hoping that this will drastically speed things up for him. But even with, I mean, using that technology is actually working for, you know, a broader research into these sort of smart gadgets mm-hmm. and assistance technology in general. I mean, they've, these smart devices for assistance have 
kind of plateaued because of uh, context awareness over the last couple of years. But they're hoping that with, um, you know, the word predictor, that these kind of devices would understand, kind of predict what we're doing better or understand the facial expressions. So maybe some sort of assistance program you know, assistance. Mm-hmm. They they actually talked about like a, a rug that Intel and GE have developed with embedded sensors with accelerometers. So you can record a person's normal routine and their gait. So maybe you have, you know, an older relative or neighbor, you know, they're walking around the carpet, feels everything. And then when it starts deviating from the norm, it alerts someone. It's like, hey, stumbling, suddenly walking horribly, fell down, need help. Mm-hmm. So kind of looking to see, you know, what's going on. Your phone reminds you of everything. Mm -hmm. I know I have mine remind me of to do everything in Mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. I always have it with me. Yep. So hopefully, you know, moving this technology forward. Some of it gets into the creepy invasive of your life factor. You know, my phone already halfway runs my life. It reminds me to do all sorts of things like, you know, go to work and go home and pay rent and take out trash and, because you might as well have it remind you to do everything just in case. They're getting even creepier too. Like uh, uh, you know, uh, on the newer Android devices, mm-hmm. Google combines what you've been searching, what you've been researching, and where you've been visiting into these automatic suggestions. Like I was oh, yes. looking for a gluten-free grocery store near me, and mm-hmm. uh, then I, I sat down at my Nexus Seven and I brought up the Google Now interface. And next thing I know, it says, "Would you like to continue researching about gluten-free products?" And I was like, "That's just weird." <laughs> Yeah. And yes, I would. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, uh, it's helpful. Oh, yeah. Uh, Anomaly in the chat room wanted to know, wouldn't uh, Surface Brainwave sensors help them out? They actually are looking into some of that. They're starting to because his ability to move, it's been decreasing. I mean, when I was young, I remember he could do his finger. He had two fingers that he could use on oh, his, yeah. you know, a button. And it's been decreasing slowly over time. And it's, Sort of goes into what they'll, it's at worst case scenario, what they call locked in syndrome, which essentially means he won't be able to move really anything to communicate. So they're working on some sort of brainwave sensors to say, hey, maybe he can still communicate in some way. So they're working on, you know, this technology to help him talk faster, you know, is interactivity with the world. They're looking towards brainwave sensors. So all of this is kind of, he's such a a figurehead that a lot of this is going to help him, but it actually will help a lot of other people. Mm, sure. So. Very good. We'll see. Yeah. So we'll see what happens and how quickly that's able to move forward and help him and others. Hopefully as fast as possible for his sake. Yes. All right, Heather. Well, why don't we pick things up a notch with the two bite news? All right. So, jeez, uh, I, I swear, I didn't even realize that club had vocals. I'm glad that one does, I, though. Yeah, I know. Crazy. So, what are we talking about? The two bite news. A moon game. Yes. It's, it's this is an online game that actually allows you to build your own moon, sculpt it. Sort of, it's a uh, they show you like the picture of the moon. Like here it is. Now, pretend like you build it. So you have rocks. You throw them at each other so they combine together until they're big enough. Then it kind of congeals into a sphere. So then you go okay. So now you take asteroids and you throw it at it. <laughs> I'm make- loving this. And and they have it. So this is. They have this gal, she's showing it on, on a laptop here where she's like, here, and here we are building a moon. <laughs> yeah. is great. So this is like a moon simulator. Yeah, is that how to build your own moon. Essentially, it's, <clears throat> you know, learning if you overshoot something, it's not going to always hit and congeal. So maybe it'll loop back and come back around. And then you see, now that you have your moon, how big an object you have to throw it to, to sort of break through the crust and create all these type of features. I see they're using so, it in schools too, which is really cool. Yeah. So the whole idea is how to 
recreate the moon. So you're kind of getting a better idea of what happened to make the moon because you're looking at, you're having to figure it out on your own. And then from that, you can kind of get a better idea of how planets and other things form because it's a very similar process. What an interesting idea because it, it seems like it would give uh, the kids that are doing it in schools a, such a like a much more, this is not the right word, but almost three-dimensional understanding of how the process works. I mean, it's one thing to read it on paper in a book like I yeah. did, but to, be, to actually manipulate the objects and cause it to happen and sort of have a better understanding of the physics involved with all of that, that's, that's much more deeper than you can get from the, from the history book. Oh, yeah. On a, on a smaller scale, I remember um, being at NASA Houston, their visitor center, and they had this little build your own space station thing, you know, little bay of, you know, touch, touch screen computers. It's like, hey, cool, I want this. And I said, if you have that science module, now you require this much power. So you had to add on a solar array. And if you had so many solar arrays, you had to have, you know, these radiators to shed heat from them. And you had like, it was one object. Did you add another crew member? Oh, now you have to do all these other things. And so it like, gave me a much better idea of adding things are hard. Well, what's kind of neat about it is I'm reading here, they say this is an online game. So the students basically just need a web browser and a yeah. computer, you know, semi-powerful enough to do it. So the school districts don't, or their kids at home don't have to install all this stuff or me. <laughs> they yeah. don't have to install now, the software do to do it. you have to, now they're saying you have to have an adult because you have to log in. And the reason there's a login is because there's actually another sort of a, a behind the scenes analysis that's going on with this game this is actually the primary goal of it is to allow the the team who made it to to analyze the learning process so so they're sort of collecting data on all that yes how quick a person catches on to all these various scenarios so you're able to look so you can initially go back and say okay how did i you know how fast was i learning this or that but in the end they're gathering in all of this data to look at an overall standard of which, you know, which ways, if they do the program this way or that way, how is it better? Well, that's a little creepy. Letting people learn. I don't well, get it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's good. It, it, it's good because then, then we can make better, then we can make better teachers and better students and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That, that's kind of the whole. Yeah. Going back to it. It is weird, though. Although, to be honest with you, not that different than what any MMO does. All, you know, they all are collecting analytics every moment that you're playing and deciding what people like to do in the game. This is yeah. not quite that same thing, but it's no no more invasive, really, than what standard games do today. Yeah. I mean, you'll have an MMO that has an analytics of, oh, wow, we watched, you know, 30 people play this little zone and... You know, 85% of the people died in this one small area. Need to adjust that. Well, and they so might, it's that kind of and they even they will even do things like they use these key combinations. I mean, they can get all kinds of information. That's just how games work now. Same with yeah. even, even you know, regular games on the computer that can collect analytics like that. Yeah. So this is at least for a good cause, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, very cool. So now I just got to get my hands on this moon simulator. You know, they, NASA did something like this with like a build a moon base game. Do you remember we talked about that on Jupiter at night like uh, forever ago? Uh, I think so. Yeah, we talked about it like a really long time ago. All right, Heather. Well, enough with the past. Why don't we do a spacecraft update? Okay, what do we got? All righty. Kepler looking for planets talked about uh, two weeks ago how it was kind of down in a safe mode because they were worried about one of the right one of the reaction wheels so now it is back up and running it is fine it is resuming its normal operation now they're going to keep watching it over the next month or so to sort of watch its performance very carefully you know af after they start um, back into normal their normal mode so it's acted up before. They have four of these reaction wheels, which essentially help keep it stable in orbit. Mm -hmm. So one of them, you need, you have launched with four. You need three. One of them died in the uh, middle of last year. And so when this one started to fail, they were really concerned because 
it would mean they were down to two, which they can't really function on. Right. So it's back up. Now, it's not failing in any sort of the way that the number two, which is the one who keeled over last year, it's not, it wasn't acting the same way as that did. Okay. It's sort of, number four has threw a little fit before and it went back to being perfectly fine. And it was a very similar situation this time. So they had it down, it gave it a rest. Now it's black up and running. All indications say that it's probably going to be fine. So as it as we move forward, they're just going to be very careful watching it for about a month or so and see what happens. All right. So but that during that time, it's actually going to still do some work? Yeah, it's going to be under normal operating procedures. We're back to action. Very good. All right, well, stand by because good news, Heather. We have a few stories that have leveled up, don't we? Yes, we do. What do we got? A couple of updates. And- Yes, Antarctic subglacial lakes. Those are those crazy little lakes underneath the Antarctic ice. (laughs) And we've been drilling towards them because they've been very isolated from the rest of the the atmosphere. Wow. So So it's like primal waters down there. Yeah. Now, one is on January the 28th. They were actually able to take a sample of one of those... Of some of that ice from there. Ah. And test it. So they were able to essentially squirt some of the water into some media to see if any if any microbes might grow. So, you know, maybe they were living in the lake. Mm-hmm. And when they actually looked at it under a microscope, they actually saw cells. And they actually responded to DNA-sensitive dye. So this is really... The first evidence that there were any sort of life in any of these Antarctic subglacial lakes. So this is big, isn't it? I mean, this is this. You say evidence it doesn't mean that there necessarily was. It just means that oh, there's... they're not. You know, science. They're not going to say yeah. definitely until they get like all the DNA testing back. Right. And also, there is some caveat to this that this is not a 100 percent completely isolated lake. They're, uh, it's able to interact with the ocean by some very, very, very little under glacier uh, uh, stream a, a little killer. bit. That could be a deal killer right there. Sounds yeah, like a deal well, there, it's still the fact there's a lot of things going on that really indicate there's something there that living there. Yeah. Because, I mean, this is the ice that deep is very pure snow. I mean, this is clearer and more you know pristine than a mountain creek or your tap water i mean mm. this is really really pure you know, ice they water do is they ought to get uh, coca-cola up in there to fund that stuff and then they can bottle <laughs> it when they're done bottle it I buy a little bit of that and drink that before the show uh-huh. come, on, come on with my power face because i got my uh-huh. i got my primal water the issue that it was trying to get to uh-huh. is that the water in this little subglacial lake is actually full of minerals. Wow, see? So I'm they're something. trying to figure out. Yeah, the high concentrations actually suggest that there is something going on, that there's maybe a water rock microbe thing going on. Maybe the microbes are munching on those minerals. So they're eating away at the minerals in the rock, which is letting the making the water more mineral rich. So we've seen that they could, maybe they could obtain energy by using um, oxygen essentially to burn the iron and sulfur in there. Essentially way you and I or Fido use oxygen to burn down sugars and fats and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but the oxygen itself is coming from the water melting off the bottom of the ice sheet. Okay. Maybe it's a, they say it's like a few pennies width of ice per year melt. And when you melt that ice, you're actually releasing tiny little air bubbles that were also trapped in there. Right. So it's about 20% oxygen. So you're having this very small amount of melt off the bottom of these glaciers, which is releasing oxygen. So now these little microbes can use that oxygen and eat up and use the energy from eating those microbes to survive. 
So now they're kind of aiming towards um, conclusively proving that they're going to need, you know, a lot more experiments to show that the cells are actually growing, that they're not just dead because dead cells can actually show up um, under the microscope, you know, and mm. key up under DNA, mm. DNA sensitive. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, the next weeks and months, they'll kind of get a better idea of whether they're actually growing, whether it's something that we haven't seen before, and actually get the DNA analysis back from those things. And that would tell we us if it's see. from the ocean, possibly. Yeah, or exactly what kind of the exactly what kind it is. So you can see all these microscopic material, be able to identify these microbes mm -hmm. much better. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that it's there is very interesting, and we can kind of get a better idea of our planet. But we can also use it for other worlds that have ice. I mean, Europa, Enceladus, uh, moons of Jupiter and Saturn. They are thought to harbor oceans of liquid water underneath a frozen, you know, surface. So almost like an egg. So it has this shell of ice and liquid surface underneath. We've actually seen some, you know, water coming out of those. So we can see that there's salt water there. So maybe we can tell... Even without sunlight, you have some sort of liberated oxygen, you have minerals, and these microbes can survive. So what means what you're saying is then, yeah, just, so if when we discover stuff like this on our planet, then it probably meant then it probably means that this could possibly some conditions like this could exist on another planet that they could survive. Yeah. Now uh, you wanted to mention something about a prime number. Yes, it came up just before the show. I, I saw it right before the show. I wasn't able to put anything in the show notes beforehand, but I might try to stick it in here after. They have discovered, so far, the largest prime number ever discovered. Oh, really? Yeah, it's one of these that they, a whole bunch of computers dump in onto the net, and it the yeah. you know the program uses all these computers to process it. I'm looking it up now, see if I can find it. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So it is, I think, oh, the number itself is over 17 million digits long. Mm-hmm. Yep. 17 million digits. I just found it. Yes. So the number, you can download a file of the number itself, and just the number a text in a text file is like 22 meg. 22 megabytes just for the number. Typed out in, t in Times New Roman uh, at a 12-point font. The number would stretch more than 30 miles or fill more than six Bibles. Yeah. This is really, really huge number, obviously. <laughs> so just kind of a interesting story that I saw. I'm glad um, nice somebody in the uh, chat room asked, asked about it early in the show. So I was trying to remember to mention it at least. Well, thank you to the chat room. See, this is, uh, this is n reason number one why you should join live, if you can, folks, on uh, Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific, which uh, is at 10.30 uh, Eastern over at jblive.tv or jblive.info if you just want the audio stream. Yeah. All right, Heather. Well, very good. So uh, should we move on to a little viewer feedback? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> It's coming out of the side by 2000 now. What do we have? All right. Somebody wrote in asking for an observatory in the Denver area. Hmm. Now, I will get to the specific Denver area here in a minute, but sort of in general, if you're looking for something or you have, because this person was looking for uh, their child. So if you have a child or a friend or you yourself are interested in things, maybe you're too far away from a dark area to do observations there's not, you know, a, a quote unquote regular observatory nearby. Maybe you have young kids or you yourself aren't able to stay up well past the time when full dark happens. Hmm. You know, there's certain times of the year where it doesn't get dark till, you know, after nine or, you know, you can't start really observing till fairly late. So you can always go to a planetarium. Right. So you still get, you know, you can learn the stars. And it's still a good idea, even if you do really want to go and see them yourself, you can, it is a starting place. You can learn your constellations, learn, you know, where things are, how they look. 
So you're not quite as lost. And don't feel bad if you're lost because I did a lot of astronomy and I traveled to, to some big, essentially giant star party convention thing where it was out in the middle of nowhere. It was so dark. Like the first night I just looked up into the sky. I'm like, I can't find anything. There's too many stars. So I laid out my blanket. And I just sat there and I looked into the sky all night trying to figure out where things were, mm. kind of familiarating myself with everything again. Mm -hmm. So there's a link in the show notes for a website that lists, you know, planetary, planetariums all over the U.S., I think all over the world as well, to kind of get an idea of where the nearest one might be to you. Now, should you be ready for, or you really want to be the real thing for telescopic observatories, Whoa. telescope observatories, if I can speak tonight, <laughs> there's uh, links in the show notes also for that to help you find nearby observatories. Okay. Now... Sometimes those are fairly far away mm. or so you can or you can't really find one close by. Go to a local astronomy club, you know, look them up. Mm -hmm. There's a link in the show notes for the Astro Astronomical League. I was, you know, part of that society when I was growing up. Generally, you can find a local club and they'll know, you know, That'd be where great there's an learn observatory. Too, I'm sure. Yeah, you can learn a whole bunch from them. Yeah. And most of these clubs, they'll have what they call star parties, whereas everybody goes out to this dark area and kind of gathers together and observes for the night. And yeah. then sometimes, like my club did, we go to schools every once in a while. And so you'd set up at a school or some sort of public location where everyone was allowed to sort of come in and maybe you can see, you know, look through all these different telescopes, kind of talk to people, learn about things, and maybe get pointed to direction to, you know, nearest, you know, big observatories or planetariums or whatever you might be more interested in. Now, um, in specifically Denver, to get to your question, there is, I looked it up in, uh, sort of in the city, as they call the Chamberlain Observatory, which I actually piqued my interest. The location, um, better location is in the show notes and linked to the observatory, but it is a really old refractor telescope. Now, reflectors are the ones you most often see with backyard telescopes, big mirrors reflects the light and condenses it. Now, a refractor is the old one long tube big lens. This thing has a huge lens. This is a historic, very historic telescope as yeah, well. Yeah. Then they have open house nights fairly regularly. So you can check the show notes for that. But it's sort of that vague idea where you find an observatory or a club or a planetarium somewhere nearby, figure out when there's open times that you can go see it and then go see what you can find. And there's plenty of, like I said a couple times, plenty of links in the show notes to help you find something nearby you. And hopefully you can learn and check things out. I want to go do that. At least like a tour of an observatory or something like that. I'm going to go check yeah. out the, uh, the link you put in there to find one. Cause they have, that's yes. a massive list. Yeah, that if, specific, uh, yeah, that specific telescope is actually, they, I think they've hooked it up for some electronic, you know, computer read, readouts. But they're actually, the, the readout is from a piece of tape around the big manual crank. So it's like there's handles that you turn to move the telescope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's just a readoff of where that is. So it's, the computer is just telling you where you are. It's nowhere controlling anything. You're just moving these big... Ever, rotating things. Do you, do you ever hear about planetary? Do you ever hear about any of these types of places doing events for like kids too? Uh, some of them do. I don't know I, how much would be applicable to kids if they'd be that interested, but if they made it interesting, I don't know. I'd like to go, and it give me a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, we when in my club, I was we'd and we'd actually go to schools, you know, and have it would be an after school event, but you'd go mm. and you'd have, I don't know, anywhere between four and twelve telescopes out there and the kids could come and you know check things out right there on their school grounds or these big observatories uh specifically that one also has a astronomical club sort of associated with it most of these big most of these observatories with public access will believe the nearest astronomy club so anytime the big telescope is open maybe you have to pay money to get to the big one but the club will be sort of spread out nearby I think there's a big grassy field here. And so they'll set up all their telescopes and those will be free. 
So you can go most often check out, you know, individual people, their telescopes, talk to them for free. And then you can always pay some money to, more often it's pay a little money to get into the main, the big dome, they call it. Mm. So. Okay. Well, those are some good tips. And of course, if you have a question for the show, you guys, you can email us, scibite at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or just click that contact link we have at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website and select Scibite from the drop down. What do you say, Heather? Should we go over to Mars and do a curiosity update? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. All right. <laughs> so what's the uh, what's the little rover that could up to this week? All righty. Continues going. We're getting ready for a, a drilling. So it's going to be the first time that actually drilled into a rock. So they're doing a number of things in this last week to sort of prep for that. Okay. When they had what they called a preload test. So they drove out to the little area that they were interested in. And they did is they placed the drill. They didn't do anything with it. They said essentially placed it upon four different locations on this rock hmm. and just sort of pressed down on it. Okay. You you know, in order to make the drill, you'd press down on it and lower the drill bit. And just, just, but just pressing, not drilling, just pressing. No, just press against it. Kind of like a little flirt. Just, hi there. Hey, how you doing? You know, shaking its hand. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> shaking its hand, why not? How you doing? Yeah. So, and then they held it on there overnight. And the reason that you just do this is because there are really, I mean, the temperatures... The air temperatures go from, in Fahrenheit, 32 below during the night mm. to, you know, maybe, I mean, sh- sorry, 32 degrees in the afternoon to minus 85 degrees in the night. Hey. So there's huge temperature swings. Oh. So what they want to do is press the arm against it and sort of measure exactly what's going on because that temperature swing, all the the arm, the chassis, everything stretches and moves about a tenth of an inch. So little more than a quarter dollar. Hmm. Going. Wow. That's that's they, significant. They say, yeah, they called it quarter dollar. I don't know why they didn't just call it a quarter. I was reading off what I had from the story. But so it's moving fairly amount. So they want to just reach out, press against it, kind of check out everything, make sure that you know the process they're going to use is just fine because if they go into drill, they might have to leave it overnight hmm. to get a better idea of what's going on. Hmm. So then once they got an idea of that, then they went and what they did, a drill on rock. Now, this means that the drill itself can just sort of have a hammering action. So that's all they did. They didn't rotate the drill at all because it can hammer and rotate to sort of dig down into the rock better. So all they did was they, they, they literally just hammered it. So they, so they just to kind of prove that that mechanism itself was properly tuned for the rocks. They kind of, so now they've pressed up against it. They've tested, you know, the knocking. Yes, they know it's fine. It's, leave, you know, it's leaving the kind of mark that they think it should. So they've got a, you know, a picture of it, you know, the little divot that they cut out of the rock. So the next thing they're going to do is what they call the mini drill test. And that's going to be another thing where they're actually doing a drilling. They'll have both the rotary and the percussive action. So they're going to generate a ring of rock powder around the hole. Hmm. And they'll kind of look at that and be able to see, will that material behave as a dry powder maybe that you could scoop it up and put it into the sampling system. Now that's just meant to do that. Now in the real What they'll do is, if that proves to be, can it go, then then they will do it in such a way that they can actually collect that that dust, those tailings, the powder from whatever they drill out. So then they can take it and do all the onboard testing that they had. So the the whole process is they're going to use this X-ray spectrometer Use that to determine the kind of chemical composition of the rock. Then they'll do all this drilling, take if they can take the the powder from the rock, the dust, and they'll examine that. They'll actually be able to drill into a depth of about two inches. So they'll be able to 
get and sieve and analyze about an half an aspirin tab <laughs> tablet's worth <laughs> of material. So we'll see. See what happens there. Somebody in the chat room actually asked a question about curiosity, about keeping it from freezing at night. And it, it is, it does have some insulation, but it is working off a nuclear reactor. Right. So it has bukus of excess energy that it can use to pump um, fluids around right. the, the... It does, it like it circulates, right? Yeah. It has like circulation throughout it, right? Yep. It can circulate to all the parts that it needs to stay warm to kind of help keep it heated overnight. So, and that also means that it is, because of that, it can use, so it has the ability to keep things warm. It has the ability to provide a lot more power and keep going at night. So, and it has a laser. And of course it has a laser. And it's not so much bulled down by the dust that, you know, coats the solar panels of these other poor rovers. So... And it has drills, and it has an x-ray, and it yep. landed using jets. Yep, a rocket pack. Yeah, so I'm just saying, yep. it is pretty so it landed cool. with a rocket pack, it has a laser, it has a particular reactor, it has drills. And it circulates warmth throughout its entire body, so that way you can yes. survive in negative 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. And continue to do science while it does it. Oh, yes, of course. Any other thoughts on that one? No, we'll just keep seeing where this goes, and I'm looking forward to the actual uh, drilling. All right, Heather, then uh, step in the time machine because it's time to go back. Close the door. Close okay. the door. Sorry. Almost in. All right, here we go. Not too bad. Not okay. too bad. This, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, this is just, just 42 years ago, uh, February 6th, 1971. What happened this week in science? Yes, the extremely most serious story of how Apollo 14 astronaut Alan Shepard Took a few shots and played golf on the moon. For science, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, actually, it was for science. But so near the end of the second moonwalk, just before they went in for the last time, he attacked, he was actually a big golfer. He attached a club to the end of a sample collection tool. So he, he couldn't like actually hold it like a golf club <laughs> because the suit is very stiff. So right. he was able to <laughs> hit it with what sort of swung his one arm. Oh, man. He dropped some golf balls down on the ground and hit it. Actually, like there's there's a video and I was listening to the audio. and It's really funny. He's like, hey, look, the collection tool. Huh. The end of it funnily, oddly looks like a uh, I gotta see like a I... club, like a six iron. So yeah, I, I turned it up. But I don't know if he's saying anything right now. Oh, you know, I realized is uh, I'm not recording that track, so they're not going to be able to hear it afterwards. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That was quiet for everyone there. Yeah, sorry about that. But yeah, that is pretty great. So, uh, you know, what's, what was funny to me is that's a little premeditated is uh, is what that is. That's uh, they, they had to plan to bring the golf balls with them. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, some of this actually was, you know, some of these things looked funny, but they were actually trying to, there was a little science extra with it. So it's looking at, you know, the gravity and something that went on. So, yeah. Cobalt from the chat room, miles and miles and miles. So he's trying to hit the ball multiple times. It sort of just doesn't really hit very well. Right. And then he gets one in that was pretty good. And then he's like, oh, it's going for miles and miles and miles. Because it's he's actually got a, a good hit it on. It's one six gravity, so it's going to go for a while. But there's another video of, what was it one of the astronauts? And people kind of laugh at it where, you know, he looks like he's skipping along. Singing, you know, Merry, Merry Month of May. Yeah, yeah. And it was, that was actually about being able to see what the suits could do. So it's like, how, how well a movement can you make? How quickly can you move? So, yeah, it was, they, no, they weren't playing around at all. No, there no, was. It's total I mean, science. Why not have a little fun? You're on the moon? That's true. If you're going to go all the way, right? Yeah. But now that golf club is actually on display in the uh, USGA headquarters. Oh, awesome. Well, uh, since uh, since I failed and I didn't record that track, which I don't know why I just didn't record that track. Uh, okay. Uh, Heather did link that video in the show notes so you guys can watch it on your own. 
Hey, what do you say? Should I recalibrate the Zybite 2000 so that way we can look up into the sky? Let's go. All right. What's uh, up there this week? This week, look Thursday through Saturday. It's kind of a multi-day event. About 30 minutes before sunset, look to the west to southwest. You actually see Mars and Mercury very close together. In fact, you actually need binoculars to separate the two of them. There's wow. an image in the show notes and links to kind of show you exactly. Yeah, they're like they're like hugging. Oh, yeah, they're right on top of each other. They're buddies. You, you actually do need binoculars to tell the, to split them apart. But that's a pretty cool event. You can put it over there and be like, yep, that's two planets. That's not just one. You can look really smart. <laughs> Is it? You want to look really smart, tell your friends. That's true. And then you know, that's why you come back every week, right? Because we'll give you a little something like, you see that right there? You see that, ladies? That's two planets. What's up? Yep. What's you'll, up? you'll be the popular. You will be the cool kid on the block. I promise. You know, if you did manage to impress a significant uh, other or a person you're interested in with that fact, then they're probably a pretty cool person. You'd want to hang out with them. Oh, totally. Yeah. So that's a good science. It's science vetting is what that is. There you go. <laughs> okay. Now, in general, Venus this week, not really going to be visible anymore. It's getting close, closer and closer to sunrise. So it's kind of being washed out. So probably going to be saying goodbye to Venus for a little while. Okay. It'll come back around. Right. Jupiter is still the cool kid on the block. In the early evenings, he's going to be high in the southern skies, moving to the southwestern skies as you go later in the night. And as I've been mentioning, the orange star, Aldebaran, is near it. And I always mention it because it is the orange star, not Mars. Mm, mm -hmm. Still be to its left this week. So. All right. There you go. And of course, all that's outlined. Yep. Let's go check that out. Heather, great show. Thank you. Great show. Now, I just want to remind everybody, join us live on Thursdays, or Thursdays, Tuesdays at uh, 7.30 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv or download the show on Wednesdays. You can also subscribe to the RSS feeds or finding, find us in iTunes and you just get us automatically. And you can always email us, sidebite at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Or you can always find Heather on Twitter. She's JB underscore Mars underscore, underscore base. All right, Heather, well, thanks for the great show. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week.